gives me great pleasure to introduce to you David McCain. In addition to being an author, Mr. McCain is an attorney and diplomat. He's a graduate of Harvard University, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and Duke University School of Law. David was the Director of Policy and Planning at the Department of State from 2013 until his confirmation as the 22nd Ambassador to Luxembourg in 2016. David is a recipient of the Distinguished Honor and Superior Honor Awards and has served as a board member for the Foundation of National Archives and is currently a member of the Consensus for American Security. Watching Darkness Fall is David's fifth book and it is a political history story told from the perspective of four United States ambassadors in Europe appointed by President Franklin, Franklin Roosevelt. This book's written in a bi biographical way and David describes the struggles of the Roosevelt administration to balance the isolationist desire of a World War I fatigued United States populace with supporting European allies against Hitler's depraved actions and flagrant militarization. As I read this piece, I often found my, in my own thoughts drawing parallels between the events and attitudes of the 1930s Europe to the events and attitudes of current day Europe. Um, I can't proclaim to be a book critic. Um, I've never even really written any kind of uh, reviews for anything, and, uh, even, even an internet purchase. So I'd like to borrow from um, some people that I feel are much more qualified than I am. Um, the Publisher Weekly describes this book as a light, lively and immersive story about a pivotal time in our history, and I couldn't agree more. Also joining us today is Holly Smith. Holly is the Editor-in-Chief of The Independent, as well as a uh, college lecturer and longtime freelance writer. Prior to joining The Independent, she was Managing Editor of Maryland Life Magazine. Her work has appeared in The Washington Post, CNBC, Econ, USA Today, and many other publications. Please join me in welcoming Mr. David McCain and Ms. Holly Smith. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming today. Um, and as I was um, telling David before we started, I loved this book. And I know moderators say that sometimes, but it's really true this time. I loved it. It is incredibly compelling and well-written, so much so that I found myself um, wondering maybe if some of the you know, ambassador's warnings might get through and might change the course of events in World War II might not unfold the way it did, you know, knowing, of course, that it, that it did. So that's to your credit as the writer. Um, and hopefully we'll have a time to talk about many figures that are involved in the book here, but let's start with the four main ambassadors that you talk about. Um, and that's William Dodd in Berlin, and then you have Bill Bullitt in Moscow, and later Paris, and then Breckenridge Long, who was in Rome, and then later sort of on the stage was Joseph Kennedy um, in London. So tell us a little bit about who they were, how they came to have FDR's ear, if not necessarily his complete trust. Great, well thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Thanks to Tony for his introduction, and Holly, thank you for doing this. Holly said she's been here since 8 o'clock this morning, and she's still, well, she's, she's not standing, but she's still sitting, and even that seems, to me seems to be a great feat. Um, so this was a, a, a book that, uh, as an ambassador, um, and I was telling Holly I was the ambassador to, uh, to Luxembourg. Um, what many people may not know is that uh, Luxembourg is a very small country. You have to have a very large map to find it um, right in the center of Europe. But it has the uh, second largest military U.S. military cemetery in Europe after Normandy. Um, over 4,000, close to 5,000 uh, fallen heroes are buried there, including General George Patton. And um, I always sort of begin these talks by just sort of saying it was really one of the inspirations for writing this book because when you walk among these, among the headstones, it's just an incredibly moving experience and you wonder how, how, how we came to be engaged in a world war. And there are obviously many, many factors and I only have chose a, a very small slice of this story, of this overall story. Um, I did choose four ambassadors who I thought were sort of central to um, Roosevelt's understanding of what was happening in Europe. And these were the ambassadors in the, you know, in the, in the major capitals of Europe, in London, in Berlin, in Rome, uh, and in Paris. And when Roosevelt came to office in 19, elected in 1932, 
uh, was uh, inaugurated in March 1933. He, had, he never spoke about foreign policy during the campaign at all. Um, and that's understandable. The United States was in a you know, serious depression, 25% uh, unemployment. The GDP had fallen to where it what had been 30 years prior to that. Um, many people were, were displaced. Um, and he felt that the domestic economy was rightly, um, he felt that it was his number one priority. And foreign policy at that time really took a back, back seat. Um, and one of the things I say in the book is that, you know, there, we didn't really have a, an overarching view of America's role in the world at that time. You, know, you have to remember this is well before the internet, well before instant communication, really before television. And so um, we were quite isolated. Uh, when Roosevelt became president, he uh, appointed, I sh should note this because it's important, uh, his Secretary of State was a man named Cordell Hull, who had been uh, a senator from Tennessee. And he's really, he was a, an expert on international trade to the extent that we had international trade. Uh, but more importantly, he actually looked like a statesman. He was, had that sort of white hair and wore these starched collared shirts, and he was an incredibly impressive looking man. And that's, and, and he also came from a safe seat, a safe democratic seat. So Roosevelt appointed him. And usually, you know, the Secretary of State will have some say in who is going to be appointed an ambassador. That's not always the case, but it's, it, was, it was true for a long time. Um, Roosevelt did not adhere to that. He gave Hull a, uh, a sheet of paper and said, I want you to consider these four individuals. Um, not the four that, uh, only two of the people on, uh, on that list were ones who became, eventually became the ambassadors that I wrote about, uh, William Bill Bullitt and Breckenridge Long. He knew he needed a, an ambassador for Germany because Germany owed significant reparations to the United States um, as a result of World War I. And he wanted somebody who was going to be very forceful, who had some stature. And he kept getting turned down. Roosevelt had run as on the national ticket in 1920 as the uh, vice presidential candidate. So he asked the man who had been at the top of the ticket, James Cox, a former governor of Ohio, if, uh, if he would be willing to serve as ambassador. Cox said no. Uh, he was making too much money and had left politics behind. And he asked two or three others, and they all turned him down. Then his uh, Secretary of Commerce said, well, what about William Dodd? And uh, Roosevelt remembered Dodd vaguely because they had met one time during the campaign, and he had quite liked Dodd. Dodd was an erudite individual. He was the head of the history department at the University of Chicago. Uh, but he was from a small town in, in, uh, in North Carolina. Um, he was not a terribly sophisticated man. He had spent a, he had spent a year in Germany during college. Um, and so he spoke adequate German. So uh, Roosevelt called him up on the phone in, um, I think it was late May, early June of 1933. And Dodd had no warning of this. He was completely taken by surprise. I mean, I don't think he actually believed that was the President of the United States on the other end of the phone. And Roosevelt said, I'd love you to come to Washington. I want to talk to you. I, I think you're just the ideal person to be um, our ambas next ambassador to Berlin. And again, uh, Dodd was very flattered by this, but e extremely surprised. He, had, he had actually had written a biography of Woodrow Wilson that had been, um, was very, uh, it was full of praise of Wilson. He was, uh, Wilson was a, really an idol for, for William Dodd. And I think Roosevelt appreciated that. Um, so uh, Dodd came to came to Washington, they had lunch in the Oval Office, and about a week later, Dodd was um, approved by a voice vote in the United States Senate. There was no debate, there was no hearing. <laughs> he just was approved. And off he goes to Berlin with his family. Um, he, found, uh, he found it to be very challenging quite early because um, 
he began to see that this was a very uh, volatile time in, in German politics. Um, Hitler at the time was the chancellor, um, but he, would, he, was not, he did not have complete control of the country. Um, and uh, um, Dodd was uh, hopeful that perhaps as, uh, as the ambassador that he could uh, help to not only bring the reparations that the United States needed, but also to really impart some of the democratic values that he knew Roosevelt believed in. But he quickly found, after meeting with some of the German hierarchy, that this was going to be extremely difficult. Um, he doesn't meet with Hitler until um, probably, I think it's July of that year. And the first meeting goes relatively well, but he's really shocked by um, how uh, forceful uh, Hitler is, and particularly how outspoken he is about what he considers the Jewish problem in Germany. Um, I think I'll leave Dodd there for the minute, maybe just introduce the others quickly and then we can go back to each one of them. Uh, that, the same year, 1933, he appoints uh, Breckenridge Long as the ambassador to Italy. And Breckenridge Long is an interesting individual. He's a graduate of Princeton. He's considered Southern aristocracy because his uh, great, great grandfather had been on the um, ticket in uh, 19, or excuse me, in 18, 18, I think he ran against, uh, as the vice presidential candidate, ran against Lincoln and, uh, and lost. But he was, um, again, uh, you know, from this very old Southern family and Long was uh, a wealthy man. He was also a very good political operative. And uh, during the 1932 campaign, he played, a, he played an important role for Roosevelt. He was a floor manager at the, uh, at the convention. Roosevelt liked him, thought he was a very um, courtly individual, a smart individual. Eleanor, however, did not like him. But um, Roosevelt gave him this job. And uh, off he goes to, to Rome. He, uh, he has a meeting with Mussolini early on and is very impressed by Mussolini. Um, says he's a man of uncommon character, of great stature. He's also very impressed by what's going on in, in Italy at the time. And this was um, just as Mussolini had really ramped up fascism in Italy. And, uh, um, you know, Long even comments, he said, you know, the, the, this, he says that the, the trains, they, they run impeccably well. They're on time all the time. And as you know, that's one of the great sort of statements about what Mussolini did. He made the trains run on time. And that clearly impressed Breckenridge Long. By the way, he had an absolutely fabulous residence there. Um, just a, uh, it was a, uh, you know, a, really a former um, manor house uh, be with beautiful, beautiful grounds. And so he lived well. He, he loved being the ambassador. The third ambassador, uh, William Bullitt, who I write about, also an extremely interesting man, probably the smartest of the four. Uh, he was uh, in the Wilson administration, actually spoke Russian fluently. He negotiated with Vladimir Lenin in 1919 um, at the, during the, uh, uh, the Paris peace talks th at, that, at that time. He then but he was very critical of Woodrow Wilson, um, saying that the Treaty of Versailles was a sellout. He left government altogether wrote a novel in 1926 that um, actually outsold another famous author at the time, um, F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. Um, he was friends with uh, Henri Matisse, um, the painter. He was uh, very good friends with Sigmund Freud and actually in the, uh, wrote a book with Sigmund Freud in the end too uh, about a biography of Woodrow Wilson. And he met Roosevelt during the 1932 campaign, and Roosevelt was immediately drawn to him, thought he was a brilliant man, and appointed him his, the, the first United States ambassador to the Soviet Union. Um, and Bullitt was very excited about this, but again, it didn't go that well. He, uh, he got there and um, had a great meeting with Stalin in which they tried to drink each other under the table, essentially. But after that, um, he really didn't have access to the uh, leadership of the Soviet Republic. And pretty soon he was being followed and the phones were being tapped. 
And so he felt he was really not having any impact. Um, again, he was seeking reparations and nothing was, nothing was happening. Um, he eventually left after uh, a couple of years, but Roosevelt appointed him as ambassador to Paris in late 1936, and there he thrived. Um, and he became really one of FDR's most important um, ambassadors. The fourth ambassador is uh, someone who many of you are acquainted with, um, Joe Kennedy. And I think we're going to talk about this quite a lot probably. He's a, Joe Kennedy is an interesting guy. He uh, made a lot of money in the film industry, um, as many of you know. He was a supporter of Roosevelt in 1932, and he wanted to be Secretary of the Treasury. And uh, um, Roosevelt said no, but offered him Ambassador to Uruguay, <laughs> which Kennedy turned down. Um, he then, after a, a few months, offered Kennedy the chairmanship of a new institution in Washington, the Securities and Exchange Commission. And um, he thought somebody that had sort of gamed the stock market the way Kennedy had would probably know all the, tr the tricks of the trade. And um, in the end, Kennedy turned out to be a really good chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission. And they, um, they really established a lot of the rules of the road for the stock market that still exists today. Um, he left that after about a year and a half and um, went back into private industry. Rosa, he then, after the 1936 campaign, he wanted to be again Secretary of the Treasury. Roosevelt said, no way. Uh, he was keeping Henry Morgenthau. But he, he said, how about Chairman of the, uh, or Director of the Merchant Marine Corps? Now this was even a step down from the Securities and Exchange Commission. But Kennedy took it. And again, he did a good job. Um, he, he was loyal, he was very competent, um, but he, uh, at a certain point he told Roosevelt's son, you know, I, now I, w I would like an ambassadorship, I want to be ambassador to the court of St. James, and I want to go to London. And, you know, the, 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 the story is, is that uh, Roosevelt's son, Jimmy Roosevelt, went back to the White House and he and his dad had a long laugh. But, in the end, Roosevelt appointed him. And we'll talk about that at, down the road, I guess. So I have other questions I want to move on, but share the story about when Kennedy becomes the ambassador and he has to meet Roosevelt in the Oval Office and what Roosevelt makes him do. <laughs> so uh, there's, there's sort of a back and forth with, with Roosevelt. He decides in the end that, he's, uh, that he will give Kennedy the job. Um, part of it is that the... Uh, 1940 election is coming is coming up, and actually Kennedy is being mentioned as a possible um, contender, if not in the top spot on the ticket as perhaps a vice president. Um, he was one of the most prominent Catholics in the United States at the time. Again, extremely wealthy, so that he could um, he could help to finance a campaign, um, and he had a real following. Um, so Roosevelt, in some ways, um, thought that getting him off the political playing field was a good idea. The other thing about Roosevelt was that he did not believe that England um, at the time was um, showing a lot of foresight, a lot of leadership, and that, and he didn't really trust the, 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 the British. And he felt that um, if we did get into a war, or even if Europe got into a war, that it would be very important to have England showing some, some leadership. And he thought Kennedy was somebody who could wake up the British um, because he was this sort of crusty, um, outspoken individual. So, okay? Okay. we all right there? Okay. okay. Um, so uh, he uh, he asks Joe Kennedy to come to the to the to the White House and to meet about this. And so Kennedy is quite excited and he. He comes to the, uh, to the Oval Office and uh, he's standing in front of Roosevelt and the President says, now Joe, I have to ask you something. Um, and Kennedy says, well, what's that? He says, I want you to drop your pants. And Joe Kennedy says, what? And he says, I, I want you to let your trousers down. And Joe Kennedy is deeply embarrassed. He doesn't understand what is going on. 
but he loosens his suspenders and his trousers drop. And there he is standing in his boxer shorts. And Roosevelt sort of starts chortling and says, you know, Joe, what they told me is true. You're the most bow-legged man I've ever seen in my life. Somebody saw you on a beach and said that you were, the, said that you were bow-legged like this. And he said, you know, when you, are, uh, when you present your credentials at Buckingham Palace, you're going to have to wear um, knee breeches. And you'll look ridiculous. Uh, so I just don't think this is the right job for you. <laughs> and Joe Kennedy, um, you know, he says, listen, uh, maybe we can work something out. Give me a couple of weeks. Maybe I can wear a cutaway. And Roosevelt says, no, that's not going to be possible. He says, just give me a couple of weeks. And so, uh, you know, Kennedy leaves the Oval Office. And again, the president and his son have a good long laugh. It's, it's, a, it's, it's an amusing story. It shows a little bit of Roosevelt's, a lot of Roosevelt's cruelty, actually. Roosevelt could be a very tough guy. And, you know, my interpretation of it, I have no idea what he was thinking. But my interpretation of this is that he wanted Kennedy to know that you can have this job, remember who's giving it to you, and take it with some humility. Um, but Kennedy did get the job, uh, and again, it didn't work out perfectly. Um, I do want to go back to another ambassador, and this is someone who, for me at least as a reader, emerged very quickly as one of the heroes of the story. And if there are to be any heroes, and that's William Dodd in Berlin. Um, and to clarify, you know, Dodd came into Berlin in 33, and I think um, by the time Kennedy came in, that was 38. So right. Dodd was already gone. So there are some years recovering here. So different things have happened in the world, you know, between Dodd coming in and Kennedy coming in. But Dodd seemed to know very quickly that, um, you know, saw the Nazis for what they were, saw Hitler for what he was. But Dodd, among the four ambassadors, was sort of the odd man out and that he wasn't the sort of East Coast, blue blood, patrician kind of background. And I wonder, it, did that have anything to do with the others maybe not taking him seriously or not, you know, not thinking that his insights were valuable? And then also, what did he know or what did he see that made it so clear to him and so obvious so early on that Hitler was the threat he was. Sure. So a couple of things. You know, first of all, let's, let me sort of give you a little bit of a general description of the State Department at the time. The State Department now is about 70,000 people. It's a, it's a huge organization. And we're represented in, you know, 200 countries. Um, we, have a, we have a very, uh, you know, it, it's, it's one, in my view, one of the really great institutions in the United States government, if not the most Im important and, and, uh, and competent group of individuals. I really felt privileged to serve with the foreign sar service officers that I knew. Um, during Dodd's time, it was a, um, an organization of 2,500 people, uh, excuse me, about, about 3,000, about 3,000. 700 diplomats, all men, most of them um, Ivy educated, they were either Harvard, Yale, or Princeton. Um, and, you know, Dodd was Virginia Tech. I think it's one of the reasons, actually, Roosevelt quite liked him. Roosevelt had a dim view of the State Department. Um, he thought that they were, um, he thought it was, he, he'd grown up with a lot of these people. He'd gone to Groton School, which was this elite boarding school in Massachusetts. He'd gone to Harvard. Um, and a number of people he knew had joined the State Department, and he felt that they were just taking extended vacations. Um, he thought Dodd was a serious guy, and Dodd was serious. And um, you know, he had an open mind about Germany when he when he went there. But after hearing stories of, um, particularly from his children, early on of Jews being paraded through the streets um, um, and being, um, you know, roughed up, M many, by the way, many Americans at the time were also being. Um, being uh, essentially accosted by Nazi thugs. And then he began to meet some of the, uh, again, some of the, some of the hierarchy of the, of, the, of, the, of the republic there. And uh, he thought that uh, Himmler was a very savvy, deeply offensive individual. Goring, he thought, was something of a clown. And in his two meetings with um, with Hitler, in this, in this, in this, particularly in the second meeting, Hitler really lost his temper and was berating 
um, berating Dodd about various things. And Dodd thought he, was, Dodd thought he was crazy. He thought he was mad. And he wrote Roosevelt. He said, I think this individual is mad. And um, the other thing that he learned quite early on was that Germany, in, in contravention of the Treaty of Versailles, was rearming. Um, that Hitler had plans to um, build a million man army. And that, um, um, you know, ultimately he worried that um, there would be war in Europe. He was very prescient about this. He writes in 1935, well before anybody else. He says, if, if Germany, Japan, and, um, and Italy were to form an alliance, um, you know, there will be a world war and uh, Europe will be engulfed in flames. Actually, that reminded me, um, when Dodd gets to Berlin and uh, Consul General George Messersmith is there, and this was very striking, he's, and talk about him a little bit, he was even more prescient with what was happening, and he made a statement, I think, in 1933 or 34, this is before the Night of Long Knives, this is before Kristallnacht, well before, that if the Jews in Europe don't get out, they're going to be massacred. So who was he, and what did he see, even more before Dodd did? So George Messersmith, again, he's a, he's a very um, interesting man. He, uh, he was somebody who was uh, homeschooled, um, I believe, in Virginia, but I'm not entirely sure of that. I have to, I have to go back and check. Too many, too many facts and figures here. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> she really, she's read it more recently than I have. Um, Homeschooled in Pennsylvania, and um, you know he was a he was a high school teacher who um, eventually became sort of the principal of a small school, joined the Foreign Service, and um, he was in Germany before uh, before Dodd arrived as a charge. And as uh, as Holly said, he's you know he recognized that that Germany was going in the wrong direction, and he wrote. He wrote memos that Roosevelt did not see, but that others in the State Department did see. Um, but again, he was, because he was not sort of part of the, the crowd, he, because he was sort of this, uh, you know, unusual character, um, he wasn't taken as seriously as it should have been. Um, he was, in fact, criticized for writing these very long, dense memos. <laughs> and even, even Dodd criticized him for that. But he understood what was happening. Eventually, Roosevelt decided to make him the ambassador to, uh, to Austria um, because he recognized the value of George Messersmith. Uh, he's a minor character in the, in the, in the, in the book, but, uh, but an, an important figure in history. Roosevelt himself seemed to have a really good grasp of world affairs. You'd mentioned he's sort of a Wilsonian Democrat and an internationalist at heart, but had to you know sort of look inward because at home we were isolationists. But I, see, I noticed throughout that when he would get, say, fawning, you know, dispatches from Bullet or something from Long, he was very good at sort of cutting through the, the fawningness and uh, fawning nature and cutting through the fluff and, and, you know, taking the facts that he needed and, and taking what he needed, needed to, to use and understand. With Dodd, it's almost like what Dodd was telling him was corroboration of what Roosevelt already seemed to know about Germany. He seemed to know the conditions on the field himself. So you know, I independent of what he's getting fed from his ambassadors, where is this sense coming from, this sort of savvy of what's really happening in the world, given how much he's dealing with at home and the New Deal and all that? Sure. So th that's an, an interesting point. So Roosevelt, as a child, um, every summer went to Germany and to France. Um, this is sort of from age 12 to, you know, right through college. Um, he uh, spoke German spoke French. Uh, he was a worldly guy. He, he, he knew Europe very, very well. Um, and he also, you know, because he was not able to travel, um, he was uh, in a wheelchair. And it was, uh, um, transatlantic travel in those days was extremely difficult. Um, he searched out as many different sources of information as he could. So there were obviously, read, he read newspapers. He talked to friends who had traveled abroad. Um, he did read a lot of cables from the State Department. Um, and whenever his ambassadors, his key ambassadors were in Washington, uh, you know, he met with them personally. I, I can tell you that does not happen today. It's very rare. 
it's very rare when President Biden's traveling to South Korea now, he's obviously with the ambassador and the ambassador's at all the meetings. But if the U.S. ambassador to South Korea comes to United, back to the United States, probably doesn't meet with the president. So, um, you know, he was, he was cognizant of the fact that he needed to learn as much as he could about what was happening on the ground. And that's great credit to Roosevelt. He also, um, as, as Holly said, he, he had characterized Hitler as a madman in 1933. Um, he, he knew that Mein Kampf, which is Hitler's essentially blueprint for world domination, which had been written earlier, 10 years earlier, um, Roosevelt was aware of that. And he was, he was worried about Hitler for uh, early on. But again, the United States had a lot of other priorities and um, he was doing everything he could to forestall not only war in Europe, he was always trying to um, organize disarmament conferences unsuccessfully. Um, and, uh, you know, I think in the end, um, interestingly enough, I think he recognized that in 1930, probably 38, 39, I think he recognized, this is just my opinion, but I think he recognized that at some point the United States would be drawn into war. Obviously that happened with Pearl Harbor and the Jap Japanese, but I think Roosevelt knew er years earlier. Now we had talked a little bit about um, Joseph Kennedy already, and, and, and he's almost uniquely unlikable in this book. <laughs> and this is a book with Nazis in it. <laughs> he, he just comes across as, I don't know what it is, aloof, crass, self-interested, uh, ambitious obviously, and, and you know, lots of issues with him and Roosevelt personally. They didn't seem to like each other personally and they went back and forth and he wanted to resign and, you know, and Roosevelt wouldn't let him and then eventually he does. Um, and yet, another ambassador was one that um, Eleanor Roosevelt called a fascist. So talk about Long and what made him uniquely bad among these ambassadors. Right, so again, uh, Breckenridge Long, ambassador to, uh, to Italy, um, a great admirer of Mussolini, leaves in 1930, uh, I think he leaves in 1937. He, uh, he's got some health issues. He thinks there's a possibility, by the way, that he's gonna be the campaign manager uh, for the re-election campaign in 1940. And, then, and uh, he comes back to the United States. Roosevelt, um, in the end, makes him an assistant secretary for administration. Um, which is a job that doesn't really exist now. But he's essentially running the State Department. Cordell Hull is traveling around the world, uh, the Secretary of State's traveling around the world, and so when he's gone, it's, it's up to um, Breckenridge Long, who's managing the department. And one of his jobs is immigration. And he uh, decides in that job that um, he's gonna do everything he can to keep Euro European Jews who are beginning to come to the United States. He's going to keep, do everything he can to keep them out. And he writes to a, a, one of his colleagues in the department and he says that, you know, what we can do is at, in, in every embassy and every uh, consul abroad, we can delay, this, this is a direct quote, we can delay and delay and delay. And, um, you know, he costs many, many thousands of people their lives, honestly. But there's a great story of uh, when Franklin and Eleanor are having breakfast one morning and they're both reading the, the morning papers and there's an article by Drew Pearson, um, I think it's Drew Pearson in the, in the Washington Star or the Washington Post, uh, writing about how Long is obstructing the entrance of, of people, to, of immigrants to the United States. And Eleanor looks, at, looks up and uh, she says to, to Franklin, you know, he's a fascist. And Franklin says, oh, Eleanor, you must not say that. I mean, you can just see this sort of patrician, you know, Roosevelt, oh, you must not say that, it's too unkind. Uh, uh, and she looks, she looks at him sort of dead eye and says, I'm saying it because it's true. Um, and she was very much his political conscience in, in a number of different um, episodes. Um, just an extraordinary, extraordinary, they had a, a bizarre relationship and she was an extraordinary woman. 
I wish we had time to get into the whole, their whole marriage, and, because that's, that is a whole separate dynamic in the book. And, and the book, even though, again, it does start with these four ambassadors, it, it covers numerous people, numerous events, and it's just, it's a tremendous narrative that you're telling. Um, and I want to do get back to one of the other ambassadors quickly before we go to audience questions. Um, you mentioned Bullet and he, when he was in Moscow, and then he goes on to Paris, and he was among the ambassadors at first downplaying the threat of Hitler and downplaying the German threat, but then he, he had clarity at some point, and he, and he realized world war, war was inevitable at some point. Um, and he did make a difference in Paris. He did do, you know, when the Nazis were, were going to bo were bombing Paris, Bullet played a role. So what did he do when sure. that happened? Sure. So Bullet is somebody, I mean, I mean, it's interesting. I actually admire Bullet. There, there, he writes letters to Roosevelt that are sort of, as Holly mentioned, they're sort of saccharine and fawning. And this, you know, he, li he literally says in one letter, he says, I love you. I mean, it's, uh, um, he's, he's a political operative. He's an insider. And he's always trying to ingratiate himself with Roosevelt. At the same time, um, you know, Roosevelt really doesn't pay much attention to that. But Bullitt does recognize that, um, particularly after uh, Munich, that um, the Munich Agreement in 1938, that war is inevitable, that the, that the, um, the British are woefully under, unprepared. He still thinks the French may be ready. And he thinks there's a very good chance that the United States is going to be drawn into this war. And he goes and he talks to Roosevelt and he says, listen, you have got to begin to put together an American Air Force as quickly as possible. We were producing something like 100 airplanes a month. Um, he said, you know, you've got to produce 15,000 a month. Uh, actually, that's what Roosevelt decided in the end. Um, so um, he, he saw this coming. He, um, I think, had a huge influence on Roosevelt in terms of, of rearmament because the United States did not have much of a military at that point. And, um, and in Paris, by the way, after Dunkirk, when the Germans are headed towards Paris to occupy it, he writes, he writes the president, he says, I'm here with my staff. We have one revolver and 40 bullets, and I'm not leaving. And Roosevelt says, you have to leave. And uh, he says, I'm not leaving. Secretary of State why, uh, cables him and says, you need to go down to Vichy, where all the other ambassadors have gone. He says, I'm not leaving. And in the end, he negotiates with the Germans to make sure that they don't destroy the city. They do still occupy it. But they don't, the plan had been to actually to, to level it. Um, and the Mar similar to what's happened in Mariupol. Um, and he negotiates with German generals, and it is not destroyed. Um, so he plays a, an important role. He's considered by many Parisians to be a, you know, a real hero. We are actually down to our last 10 minutes. So I wanted to ask if we have any audience questions. Um, we do have a microphone you can come up to. I have um, one brief question. One brief question and then uh, uh, a, a, a longer question. Uh, Ambassador Dodd, any relation to Senator Tom Dodd and obviously no. Chris Dodd? Okay. No, a lot of people ask that, but no. Okay. Um, Kennedy. Um, I'm a Kennedy file, uh, not a Joseph Kennedy file, but I've got a Kennedy file. Um, and I worked for Senator Edward Kennedy in his presidential campaign many years ago. Um, I guess my question with respect to the father versus Jack Kennedy, Jack Kennedy writes, why England slept in terms of why, why did England in some respects um, just feel as if Again, the, the, the tsunami was, was rising, and yet England and France basically were asleep. Why? What led them to basically have blindfolds? Sure. So it's a great question. You know, you have to remember that World War I was in the, um, was in the re rearview mirror, but not out of sight. It had only been 10 years. And... Um, they had literally lost a generation of young men. They had a vote in the Oxford Union um, about whether or not, um, you know, if there was a, um, 
declared war, whether they should fight, and it's overwhelmingly, no. Young people did not want to go back to war. And uh, England had, you know, de 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 depleted not only um, human treasure, but it had depleted its economy as well. And so there was just no appetite for war. And that was, uh, you know, if you, if you go back to Neville Chamberlain in, in 1938, um, he basically uh, did everything he could to find uh, common ground with Hitler. Uh, and he did find common ground, and Hitler had lied to him. And, um, you know, he, he'll forever be known as somebody who, uh, who uh, was an appeaser. Thank you. We have other questions? Can you come over to the microphone? I believe I read a book years ago about the um, Dodd, the ambassador to, to Berlin, to Germany. He had a daughter yeah. that was, was uh, too comfortable and colluding with and ha having uh, all kinds of relationships with, with uh, bad people in, in Berlin. Is, is, was that true? It, it is true. And uh, the, the book is... Um, in the Garden of Beasts by Eric Larson, and I shouldn't be promoting another book, but it's a wonderful book. Um, it really is. It's just a terrific book. And he goes into great detail about Martha Dodd, uh, who did, who had a relationship with a number of journalists in, um, in Berlin, as well as with a Soviet spy, and, uh, and, and even a couple of, I think, a couple of members of the Nazi party. And, and Thomas Wolfe, the great novelist Thomas Wolfe. So, uh, which I do mention that part of it. But, um, it was, you know, because it was so well covered by Larson I, and, and not really in that, in the end, that relevant to what the ambassador was doing, uh, I did not spend a lot of time on her. Mm -hmm. But she's well, an interesting character. I don't think Larson can write a bad book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. So I read um, Len Chaney's great book, Citizens of London, and maybe I'm wrong, but if I remember correctly, Joseph Kennedy is portrayed not in a, in a good light at all as U.S. ambassador, and I'm thinking it was almost like he didn't care, he just wanted to get back to America, and that the, whereas when John Gilbert Winant, who succeeded him as ambassador, he was revered by the, the British people and they put a statue of him in London. And um, so is that the correct take on Joe Kennedy as ambassador or not? I think it is the right take. Um, I'm actually, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of the Kennedy family in general as well. I actually was the CEO of the Kennedy Library Foundation um, for a year. Um, and uh, have high regard for President Kennedy and, and for Bobby and for Ted as well. But the father was a very strange guy. And, um, you know, during the bombing of London, um, he had rented a, a country estate um, outside, well outside of London. And um, so he was, you know, he was holed up there a lot of the time and probably having an affair with um, um, Claire Booth Luce. <laughs> So um, not, not the most admirable of, of individuals. And John Wynett, on the other hand, uh, I don't talk about him in the book um, in, 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 to a, a large, to a, any great extent, but there's a wonderful story about Wynett when he's in, he actually was uh, ambassador also during the bombing of London, and he's in his office, he sees bombs falling not far away, he actually uh, doesn't run to the basement. He runs outside, and he goes to help. And he's not doing it with a sign that says, I'm the American ambassador. He just takes his jacket off, and he's just helping people. Somebody recognizes him, and um, they, you know, it, does, it gets in the paper. And for that reason, he was considered um, you know, somebody who was just a deep humanitarian Cared, cared about the, the, what was happening to the, to the uh, British people. Okay, one more question? Yeah, if you, if you wouldn't mind. I'd love if you could just talk about Winston Churchill. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't directly impact what you've been saying, but it's all throughout, I assume. So. Yeah, 
So Winston, now Winston Churchill is all throughout. So he and, very quickly, he and Roosevelt did not have a good relationship. Um, Roosevelt had met him when Roosevelt was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy in, uh, during the First World War. Roosevelt was Lord of the Admiralty. And um, Rose, uh, Roosevelt says he was a real stinker. That's how he describes him. And even worse, Churchill uh, professed to not even remember Roosevelt. So, um, but what, what, you know, what's, what's in, really, the, one of, I think one of the great moments is when uh, Roosevelt sends Harry Hopkins, who is his loyal aide, uh, to meet, with, um, to meet with, with Churchill. And Hopkins is this incredibly uh, brilliant man Simple, you know, he's, a, he's from uh, Des Moines, Iowa. Um, he went to uh, Grinnell College. Um, he's a great humanitarian, a, a terrible dresser. It looks like he's always slept in sleeping in his suits. He gets off the plane, these men with bowler hats and pinstripe suits meet him, and they just can't believe this is the representative of the United States that Churchill has sent to meet with the prime minister. But Churchill immediately uh, takes to him. And they form this, he was supposed to be there for two weeks. It turns out he's, he's there for six weeks. They form this great bond of friendship. And it really is the linchpin for the, for the relationship between Roosevelt and Churchill because they both trust Harry Hopkins. Well, this has been wonderful. We are actually out of time. This was fascinating. Um, David's going to be signing his books in the activity center right across the way. It's air conditioned, so you're going to want to go there. I encourage you to buy the book. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it.